Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and welcome to my lecture on basic laparoscopy. To download the PDF version of my lecture, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaina. Reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology, Chapter 10, Endoscopy, Hysteroscopy, and Laparoscopy. This is the outline of my lecture. So basically, laparoscopy provides a window to directly visualize the pelvic anatomy as well as a technique for performing many operations with less morbidity than the traditional laparotomy. So as a side note uh, about the history of laparoscopy, the first human laparoscopy was performed in 1910 in Sweden. And by the mid-1970s, laparoscopy had been adopted as the method of choice for female sterilization. Laparoscopic visualization is excellent because the video camera and endoscope magnify the image. So what are the indications for laparoscopy? In the olden days, the most common indication used to be female sterilization, but nowadays, we use diagnostic laparoscopy in the evaluation of pelvic pain. Other indications include removal of the of ectopic pregnancies, resection or ablation of endometriosis, ovarian cystectomy or salpingo of horectomy, myomectomy, hysterectomy, lysis of adhesions, removal of intraperitoneal uterine device, lymph node dissections, ovarian biopsy, and urogynecologic procedures. The limits and indications of surgical procedures via laparoscopy will depend largely on the experience and judgment of the gynecologist. Absolute contraindications to laparoscopy include intestinal obstruction, hemoperitoneum that produces hemodynamic instability, severe cardiovascular or pulmonary disease, and tuberculous peritonitis. Relative contraindications include morbid obesity, large hiatal hernia, advanced malignancy, generalized peritonitis or peritonitis following previous surgery, inflammatory bowel disease, and extensive intra-abdominal scarring. For gynecologic laparoscopy, we usually prefer general anesthesia and this ensures adequate muscle relaxation, patient comfort, and the ability to manipulate intra-abdominal organs. The standard laparoscope is 10 mm in diameter, but laparoscopes come in sizes varying from 2 to 10 mm. Laparoscopic telescopes come in 0 degree to 30 degree lens angles, but in gynecologic laparoscopy, we prefer the 0 degree type. Although there are some uh, laparoscopists who prefer the 30 degree lens angles because it's easier to use it, especially when doing procedures such as total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Most laparoscopes are 30 centimeters long and provide a field of vision of 60 to 75 degrees. The inferior margin of the umbilicus is the preferred site of entry because this has the thinnest area of the abdominal wall. Carbon dioxide is the preferred gas to distend the abdominal cavity because this is not flammable as opposed to oxygen. However, um, this quickly forms carbonic acid on the moist parietal peritoneal surface, which can um, result in considerable discomfort to a patient without regional or general anesthesia. For abdominal entry, we can use a various needle, which has a retractable cutting point that is used for entry into the abdominal cavity for the purpose of insufflating the abdomen with gas for laparoscopy. We also use a trocar, which could be blunt or bladed, or an optical device for entering the abdominal cavity for laparoscopy, and this will also serve as the cannula for holding the laparoscope or laparoscopic instruments. Generally, there are three techniques to access the abdomen. So first, we can use the various needle insertion to create a pneumoperitoneum, and this will be followed by trocar placement. Now, an intraperitoneal pressure of less than 10 mm Hg will be a reliable indicator of correct intraperitoneal needle placement or a correct placement of the various needle. And once you are sure that you have placed the needle correctly, then you can begin insufflating uh, with the carbon dioxide gas. The second technique is by direct trocar placement. And the third is an open or hasson technique that can be used when adhesions are expected, particularly under the umbilicus. 
And these are the primary trocar entry sites. So the usual sites for insertion of the insufflating needle or the primary trocars include the following. So we have the infraumbilical fold, which is the most common site. We can also enter through the supraumbilical fold, the left costal margin, which is the located in the left upper quadrant or the palmer's point. And this entry is used or considered for patients with suspected or known periumbilical adhesions when there's a umbilical hernia or after three failed insufflation attempts at the umbilicus. We can also use uh, the, that area midway between umbilicus and the pubis. And finally, the left McBurney's point. So once the abdomen is insufflated to 15 millimeters HG using a various needle, then the primary trocar can be inserted. Just a word of caution though, primary trocar placement leads to the majority of vascular and bowel injuries. So be very, very careful when inserting the trocars. Open laparoscopy, often called the Hasson technique, can be used as an alternative to the various needle. Instead of blind entry into the peritoneal cavity, we do a small incision over the lower umbilical area and up to the level of the fascia and parietal peritoneum and then insert the primary trocar. So how about secondary trocar entry? So once the primary trocar is in place, then we can insert the telescope with the camera attached to visualize the pelvis. Secondary trocars then can be placed under direct visualization with the camera, which is why there are fewer vascular and bowel injuries with these um, secondary trocars. The third and fourth puncture sites are often required for complex cases. So this is an example of a tro the usual trocar entry that we do for gynecologic surgeries. So as you can see here, the primary trocar will be point A and the secondary trocars will be point B, D, and C. So once the primary and the secondary trocars are in place, then we can set the patient in the Trendelenburg position like you see in this picture. So this is a very important position because it displaces the bowels upward and this allows better visualization of the pelvic organs, which is our main operative site. Operative laparoscopy may be performed with mechanical instruments such as extensive variety of scissors, scalpels, endoscopic syringes, myoma screws for myomectomy, suture devices, electrocautery instruments, both unipolar and bipolar, but however, in gynecology, we prefer a bipolar electrocautery instrument, harmonic and vessel sealing devices for hemostasis and cutting, suction irrigation, stapling devices, endoscopic clips, and laser instruments if only available. During operative laparoscopy, stabilization of the pelvic organs is essential such as traction and counter-traction on the edges of an adhesion. Multiple trocar sites are needed so that the primary surgeon and assistant can use both hands in during the operation. And these are some of the instruments that we use for gynecologic laparoscopy. You see here a variety of graspers and you also see here the bipolar electrosurgical instrument that we use. Indications of laparoscopy in gynecology include the following, and as I've already mentioned, historically, uh, sterilization was the most common indication for gynecologic laparoscopy. Now, we use uh, gynecologic laparoscopy for other indications such as the diagnosis and treatment of infertility, the diagnosis and treatment of ectopic pregnancy, management of pelvic pain, but in doing hysterectomy, myomectomy, the management of adnexal masses for cancer staging, including paraaortic and pelvic lymphadenectomy, tubal reanastomosis, appendectomy, uterosacral ligament transection, presacral neurectomy, retropubic bladder neck suspension, and other complex urogynecologic procedures. As for the complications, most of these injuries are secondary to primary trocar placement at the umbilicus and involves major vascular injuries or the bowels. So other complications include bleeding 
and laceration of the major blood vessels, including epigastric obturator, iliac vena cava and aorta, and surgical site bleeding. The laceration of major blood vessels are usually due to uh, trocar placement. So we also have intestinal injury secondary to trocar placement or could be secondary to a thermal injury, urinary tract injury, anesthetic complications, equipment malfunction, other endoscopic instrument injury, other thermal injury, and subcutaneous emphysema. For safety, it has been recommended that lateral trocars or the secondary trocars must be placed at least 5 cm above the symphysis pubis and at least 8 cm from the midline. The incidence of ureteral injuries varies from 1% to 4% with laparoscopic dissection of the cardinal ligaments. The risk of incisional hernia is increased for port sites of 12 mm or greater and extra umbilical sites. A rare but life-threatening complication of laparoscopy is gas embolism, and this produces hypotension and a classical mill-wheel murmur that can be heard over the entire precordium. So for this last part, we will talk a little about laparoscopy in pregnancy, and you will realize in this lecture that indeed laparoscopy can be done even during pregnancy. So laparoscopic surgery may provide better visualization and less manipulation of the gravid uterus. Indications for laparoscopy in pregnancy include suspected appendicitis, ovarian torsion, and gallbladder disease. Laparoscopic surgery can be undertaken in all of pregnancy trimesters. However, the optimal time to operate is early in the second trimester. In the third trimester, surgery may be technically difficult due to the enlarged uterus. Pregnant patients are positioned in supine or lithotomy with a leftward tilt, and this is uh, done to reduce compression of the vena cava and the subsequent effect on cardiac output and placental blood flow. It is best for intra-abdominal pressure to be maintained between 8 to 12 mm Hg and uh, insufflation of the abdomen to pressures that are more than 15 mm Hg may affect maternal and fetal physiology, including a reduction of maternal cardiac output, an increased risk of maternal respiratory acidosis, and a decrease in placental perfusion. Now, to decrease this risk of injuring a large uterus during third trimester or late second trimester, an open entry technique or entry in the left upper quadrant of the palmar point should be considered. The American College of Chest Physicians recommend thromboprophylaxis for all pregnant patients undergoing surgery, and that includes laparoscopy. The addition of low molecular weight heparin is suggested for procedures that last longer than 45 minutes. Early ambulation should be encouraged postoperatively, and prophylactic tocolytics are not routinely recommended. So we leave that to the discretion of the surgeon or the obigynecologist. So, in summary, we've talked about indications and contraindications to laparoscopy, laparoscopic equipment and techniques that we use for gynecologic laparoscopy, the complications, and finally, uh, doing a laparoscopy and during pregnancy so that's it for my lecture thank you for watching this lecture and please don't forget to subscribe in my youtube channel and my wordpress site doc thank you